So, Cordial, welcome. We have dry uh, air, so I need to take a sip of water. Uh, to, uh, here's to yours. Uh, you, you have uh, succeeded in becoming fathers, not only man, being a man, but uh, you contributed to becoming a father. Uh, the first question on Mansein, do you have to become a father to be considered a true man? What about you? Did you have the feeling, only now I'm really taking myself seriously? Does it belong to you? Yes or no? Being a father is a great feeling. Whether you really need it to live out your masculinity, I would say rather no, but uh, who wants to do so should do so. It's a great time. Lutka, it was inside me. I just wanted, I come from a family with many children. I utterly loved it. Uh, three siblings, uh, I had three siblings, all with just one year, and I wanted something similar. I wanted to continue. It was also inside me, and it also came out. <laughs> As a matter of fact, it was not a conscious decision. It uh, uh, was generated out of a coincidence. I would not say it was uh, a big desire. Nonetheless, it's so enriching. It's utterly beautiful. I felt very male or masculine before. It didn't make such a big difference. But what I really perceive, so many things are seen in a different perspective in a certain clarity in my life. In some years' time, I will understand better what other men mean by this. I could not classify that because I'm on this track. Now, uh, I would love to come back to this. Wonderful. What about you, Jörn? No. You say no. It does not belong to masculinity. Perfect. Yes, and I, if I had not become a father, I would still remain a man. How can you define masculinity or becoming a father? You have heard a, a lot about this, and you will he hear even more tomorrow. Now, on the topic of uh, fatherhood, you said you write uh, the books so as to make them superfluous. Fatherhood is a topic. Uh, it's almost trendy. You find it again in Der Spiegel, fragile fathers, and also in psychological journals. We men have problems in orienting ourselves. We are supposed to be the great lover, have a good relationship. The father who also produces cool YouTube uh, footage because he rocks with his children. Is that correct? Is it a trendy theme? Or is it true that many fathers come into your office and reveal their problems? Uh, fortunately enough, it is a trendy theme. Yes, for a long time. Well, I probably not, but others, we have been working on making this into a topical issue so that we fathers become a, a social issue. So I welcome all uh, articles that appear, although m much crap is uh, being written on that uh, theme, every that a change in the gender relationships is a uh, desired outcome, and also changes in the fatherhood, motherhood, and, and in uh, psychological counseling, it is a must. So uncertainty that comes hand in hand with um, so us still feeling the traditional requirements, but also modern requirements that have come on top of that. It has not been replaced. While in the past we were only the breadwinners, while today we are only also the uh, uh, playing companions, um, uh, quite often you hear something like crisis of masculinity of the men and of fathers. I think it's a fitting, but I, psychotherapist, uh, we love crisis. Uh, we psychotherapists uh, love crisis. Uh, I must say I am quite happy that fatherhood, uh, manhood is in crisis because this gives us an opportunity to deal with it also as a society. and. Uh, to end up with a more reasonable form of uh, masculinity uh, um, than what has been imposed on us. I'm a big fan of crisis. What do you 
expect? What do what you hope for? How would you like uh, society after the crisis? Well, once again, for me, and uh, I was serious with my books. I wish my uh, children or rather grandchildren, when, when once uh, if they read the blurb, uh, hey, how gross is that? Uh, was it really? true that there was so much discrimination against men and against the women was there such a split up between what men were supposed to do women were supposed to do that's my utopia that sooner or later we don't uh, need to talk so much about this issue because well uh, to put it uh, bluntly we have uh, reconciled ourselves none of us will uh, live through it uh, my focus is it will uh, take 400 to 500 years I made a forecast, I extrapolated the number of uh, men that take out a parental leave and how many teachers you have in nursery schools, it's better and better. In 400 years we would have reached a total parity. I think we should give us uh, so much time. What about it? I hope I'm not too pessimistic. Well, looking around, I. I don't know what the exact question. Many fathers that are here in the room want to spend more time with their children. Is that right? I myself live in Prenzlauer Berg. If anywhere in Germany you have so many fathers that are on the playground on Tuesday morning, it's there. But I think it's a distorted vision of the overall picture. What about Germany? How many fathers, for example, take parental leave? for some months. Well, please don't generalize uh, uh, Prenzlauer Berg. Uh, I had this at a conference. It's not so bad. Uh, uh, I saw th three fathers with uh, such um, uh, uh, b babies at the bakers. Uh, it's a problem of perception. When we see three men with uh, babies, well, we would say, OK. Uh, these youngs here, this uh, group here is not representative because who gets here? As always, you always uh, preach water to the fish, so um, at least they are on their way to cope with, to emancipate. But I took pleasure. There was, while there was uh, this uh, still present, I looked at the biologists as a psychologist. You cannot not observe the by walkers. The reality, the first, they laughed. Ha <laughs> ha. Masculinity, they laughed out. Others took uh, their cell phones and took pictures and sent it apparently to other. Then a well-established couple dropped by and they just smiled. When we go out and ask the people, the society as a whole, what do you think of what we are doing here? Most of the 95% of the people would say, that's rubbish. You've got time for that. So there's much work to be done. So discrimination. You, uh, it sounded as if, if I uh, go with, uh, uh, I will get uh, cr cross remarks when I go with my baby on t Tuesday morning. Well, uh, not necessarily uh, in Prenzlauer Berg. Uh, well, as a father who takes 50-50 uh, share, I am discriminated against 20 times per year. That's a matter of fact. It uh, uh, la took one year before the educators uh, uh, admonished me that uh, the nappies were all used up. So uh, that's uh, the stereotype of uh, the nursery school teachers. Uh, a father cannot notice. Uh, well, it's uh, funny. All people think we can send rockets to the moon, but uh, taking care of uh, young children, uh, that's something that they do not believe we can do. But uh, praise, well, I have uh, been praised so often for keeping my children th in the right position. But that's uh, discrimination. Uh, if, uh, as if somebody uh, with bl black skin is, uh, is uh, told, but you speak so well German. Uh, so I do the 
the most normal thing, taking care of my children. Why do they have to press Björn enjoy in the past? Uh, women looked beside you and now you reap so many positive glances when you take care of a child. But it's too late. I'm taken out of the market. So, in other words, you see yourself as a lonely sparehead. It's not yet the time. Yes. Well, it's not a perspective. This is a reality. Uh, I would say such an event is a distortion of reality. Uh, here, uh, this is uh, probably the uh, chosen few, the 0.4 not, 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 uh, percentage of. Uh, but um, I'm being so negative. But things are changing. We are reaching the media uh, last uh, time, or oh, yesterday. I wrote an application. We will get uh, a funding for online consulting for uh, male victims of violence. Uh, be, um, as long as uh, uh, women and children are victims, they will get funding. But I, I would not uh, minimize the fact that quite often men are also the perpetrators. But uh, we need to see also men as possible victims. I'm utterly optimistic that in 500 years' time, we will have a fully emancipated society with uh, parity between the majority. Instead of planting or on top of planting trees for our neighbors. So, so it's certainly not yet standard. Uh, I even believe it has also been touched upon by the previous speaker. You need to participate in the child's life from your perspective of psychologists. What do children need? Do you feel that uh, there are certain things in the Gauss normal curve? There are things that you would ascribe rather to fathers, or do you really have a classical thing? Or would you rather say, as long as they are both present, uh, it does not matter whether they are men and women. Well, the question drives into the um, environment. Nature, nurture debate. What comes out of nature? What is made by nurture? This debate will never be decided. Uh, there are so many opinions about this. I, uh, quite openly, I believe so much is constructed by society. So many things are just uh, by mm, the simple fact that so many role models are ascribed to us, are imposed on us. Some uh, things can uh, change arbitrarily. A hundred years ago, pink was a typically male color, and it has changed in the meantime. So I think we have so many rooms for change. I'm, I've got to say so because I'm a psychologist. But one thing is, one thing is clear, yes. Uh, one thing is, exists, uh, sexual uh, or gender identity can be uh, uh, taught or, or can be shown only by the same gender person. So. Uh, my wife can never be a, a male role model. It's uh, trivial. Uh, we need to have uh, men and women in all mm, uh, realities of life. Uh, let's say m more men in nursery schools and more women in car workshops. I think it will be very difficult to, uh, to get a controversial panel. Now, what about you, Martin? Well, I told you so. Most of them will know you. Reinforcing masculinity, you have a blog, you do manner coaching. It's about values, it's about mission. Where do I want to get? Uh, looking just at your blog, one would say, well, mid-20, I want to have great sex. I want to go to bed with so many women. How relevant are these themes now that you have all of a sudden become a father? They are still very topical. Uh, it's a part of my work. 
people that come to coaching, these are quite often men that uh, look for advice in the areas of uh, flirting. So my professional career keeps me in contact with these issues. But I'm talking out of my own uh, experience. It was it rather came as a surprise. What's happening right now? Well, in a few months' time, I'll be a dad. It was an enormous settlement and categorization. What matters? What does not matter? My timeline. How much do I look ahead? Uh, one year or two years ago, it was just a winter is cold. Uh, where would I travel? Because I have created something that allows me to do so. Well, what about vaccines? Or what about about a place in the nursery school, kindergarten, school. So completely new topics have reached. And what I represent uh, on the blog, uh, male self-assertiveness, uh, flirting and sexuality to try oneself out and to have fun. It is still there, yes. Uh, it is uh, uh, um, in a pause. My partner is. Uh, uh, of the same mood, of if I, uh, yeah, of course I will uh, flirt with a woman if I find her hot, but we will not exchange telephone numbers and go to bed together. But it's uh, still part of myself. I like flirting. It's a part of uh, interaction that is simply fun. But nonetheless, the head is much more focused on the family, re taking over responsibility. Yes, I said so. You were there during that president. I practically worked all three minutes, but my I quite liked it. I found it cool. I still find it cool, but my wife who takes, I don't think it's so cool if you are away 100 hours per week. Well, and nor does your daughter. And it's so funny to see this uh, little creature developing. So I have to introduce working hours, uh, working schedule. So a totally new type of week planning. It's so utterly clear. I know it. Yes, that's uh, right now on the agenda. Anything else? Well, I can also suffer. It was an ecstasy. I will take a break for one year. If I have the feeling that it is an impairment to, to my relationship to the family, I would be an idiot if I continued like this. Björn uh, told us so much. Uh, we imitate so much. Uh, I want uh, to make my contribution to a great development or to develop also I, uh, our relations. Have I given an answer to your question? Yes, absolutely. Now, it's really fresh in your case. Of course, it's really new. So my question is, how did you th what did you think? I mean, before it happened, what did you think it was going to be like being a father? And what is it like now? And in particular, how did you think you were going to be as a father? And how are you now as a father, now that the child is there? Well, when I heard the beautiful message, the beautiful news, yes, exactly. Do you remember that moment? Oh, that was a tough moment when I heard the beautiful news. Quite frankly, it was more of a shock. You know, quite frankly, it was more of a shock. You see, I'd always wanted to have children, but that was like a time-moving frame. I mean, what happened was when I was in my mid-20s, I said, well, in my early 30s, I can become a dad. And when I was in my late 20s, I said, oh, I can still be a dad when I'm in my late 30s. So I always seemed to push it ahead in front of me. And even before that, I was always very picky about the relationships that I entered. And I knew that this woman that I was together with was a great woman. Yes, she was. But when she said, hey, you know, I think I'm pregnant, that was really a shock because that was not in line with my concept that I had for my life. It was something entirely different. And then came this phase when I asked myself, well, what does this mean? What are the implications now? So what did I expect? And now I'm getting back to your question. I expected my life to end. I thought everything that's fun is over. Now I have to take on responsibility. That's what I expected. I expected re responsibilities, lots of them. Plus, of course, all these predictions that I heard from other fathers and mothers who said, the first two years are so tough. You know, it's nice, it's so beautiful, but forget about your sleep. You're not going to sleep at all during the first two years. So I said, OK, I have to learn somehow 
how to uh, sleep only three hours a night and still look fresh. So these were my expectations. That's what I was preparing myself for. You see, I haven't been together with my girlfriend for so long, with my woman, two and a half years now. So that's still quite new. We've had quite an intensive time together, and we've traveled a lot together, sometimes in a camper van, sometimes for a month or half a year abroad. We, we've done all of that um, very extensively, but we don't really have a very harmonic relationship. Whereas other people who see us from the outside, they say, you're so beautiful together, but we fight a lot. And um, so that was the background, so to speak. These were the thoughts that I had in mind, the expectations I had. And now that the child is there, I have to say, quite frankly, um, the last time that I really had so much sleep was when I was 16. I sleep eight hours a day, every night. We are blessed because our child really sleeps through the night. It was like that from the very beginning. The baby hardly ever cries, laughs a lot, has fun. Um, a good baby, it's now, the baby is now seven years old. And well, I can feel that, so, I can sense this feeling of envy in the audience. <laughs> yeah, sorry, uh, but you'll have to bear with me now. You'll have to hear my story, you see. She has found out now that when she smiles, the other people around her will also smile, and I think she even starts to use that for her own purposes. But still, my life has become more structured and also very healthy. I have healthier food, I sleep regularly. I can therefore focus more on my business because there are not so many other things going on. There's not too much distraction. My life is very clear and straightforward now. Of course, the relationship with my partner we still have to sort this out, you know. We have to find our life now, uh, what our life is supposed to lead, uh, look like as a couple with a kid now. We still have to sort that out. But even, you know, with my partner, overall, I could say it's not as tough as I had expected it to be. Um, well, that sounds good. Now, what I find very interesting is there are various different ways of being a father. You already told me before this uh, session that you're a 50-50 father, which means you take care, uh, take care a lot. No, not really a lot, 50%. That's normal. That's one half. Oh, yes, but Martin, I mean, in your case, you don't take care of the baby 50% of the time? No, not at all. So you have the classic model? Yes, exactly, the classic model. Um, my partner takes more care of the baby than I do. And, but that was clear from the very beginning. You see, I also talked about this with some friends. We are in the early phase now. Of course, the child is new. And during the first few months, I think the baby always depends very strongly on the mother. I also take her in my arms sometimes. I play with the baby. But for example, I can't breastfeed the baby. That's the task of the mother, which means the mother will spend much more time with the child just because of that. Plus, I work as a freelancer. Now, if you're, if you're not a freelancer, then um, this may sound weird to you, but I can really only talk about my world. It's my world. I'm a freelancer, and I, you see, my partner, she is uh, an employee. And I told her, you see, if I quit for half a year, if I don't go on with my freelance work for half a year, then this will be a terrible setback for our business. You know, compared with where I'm standing now, it would not be the end of the business, but it would really be a disastrous setback. Whereas you, you work for Zalando, even if you come back after your paternity leave, uh, your maternity leave after a year, Zalando, the company, your employer will still be there. So that was a specific situation for me as a freelancer, of course. And um, of course, it was clear to me that the very first month I wanted to spend at home with the mother and the baby because that's what I was told, and that's what, what Sharan said today, the first month. You know, it's sacred, it's a holy process, the first month you have to be there. So if you're uh, going to be a father one day, be sure that you really spend the first month at home. And then after that, I try to figure out how I can continue my work. Now, I have the luxury that sometimes I can work in my home office, but sometimes I also have to go to the company. But my f partner, she likes it that way, it's no problem for her. And she even enjoys the fact that um, she, for the first time in her life, she doesn't have to do a job, but really just take care of her baby and do other things. OK, now I'd like to hear something from you about that, because um, I think 
he took care of the baby very much, very early. I think when the baby was only seven months old, you already spent a lot of time at home with your kid. So from your side as a psychologist, I mean, can you make a statement on that? Is it really possible to arrange it any way you want, just as long as somebody is at home? Or would you say that there's a phase when it's mainly the mother who is in charge? Well, I think there is definitely one area where I felt uh, not really adequate, and that was breastfeeding. Breastfeeding is not my strength. But apart from that, I think I could handle all the other tasks. Okay, so when did you start to take over a bit? When did the mother go back to work and you started to take more care of the kid? Well, what we normally did was, um, as far as the working hours goes, uh, as far as the working time goes, my partner, she took care of the first seven months because she had to breastfeed, and then I took care of the second seven months, which makes 14 months overall, because uh, for your parent, parental leave, a couple gets uh, money from the state for a maximum of 14 months. So we had 14 months during which we wanted to stay at home to receive money from the state. First of all, my wife seven months, and then me seven months. Now, it was a bit tough for my wife as well when she figured out that after these seven months, she was going to have to go back to work again. For some women, um, for some women, this is, I think, a bit hard to take. For example, when my wife sent an email to her boss, a female boss, by the way, and to tell the boss that she was going to be back uh, at work after seven months, and her boss wrote back and said, don't you really want to think about that again? Do you really want to leave your child alone at home so early? And as I said to my wife, didn't you tell your boss that I was going to take care of the boy? Did your boss really believe that the seven-year-old boy, is go uh, that uh, son is going to stay at home alone? But you see, we had another look at the email the boss wrote, and she really wrote, do you want to leave your child at home alone after seven months? So that's something that women are confronted with, this idea that if they go back to work and their partner takes care of the kids, they are not good mothers. And my wife also found it a bit tough, you know, when she heard that from her boss. She also found it a bit tough when I told her that I was going to take over after seven months. But that was the idea. She is in charge of the first seven months, and I take the next seven months. Even though I have to say very clearly that all of us who are sitting here, we are in a luxurious position. We simply could afford to do in that way. We have a university degree. We are psychologists. Of course, we are poorly paid, but of course, not so poorly paid. Um, we're living in a society, though, where some men um, earn like 24% more than the woman's. S suppose there's a couple. The woman earns 1,000 euros, and the husband and her husband, um, 1,300 euros. Then it's hard for me to tell them that they should both take care of the child equally. Out of economic and financial necessity, it is important for them to be sure that the man continues his work because he earns mon uh, more money. OK, which leads us to you. Um, you um, chair this uh, organization that unites, I think, about one million managers across Europe. So. How many of the managers say, I'll stay at home now that the kid is there, and I don't care what that means for my career? Well, a lot has changed with that respect. Now, when I hear what the others have just said, in particular here to my right, um, when I was his age, it was like stone ages. There was no discussion about that. It was clear who was going to stay at home with a child and who was going to go back to work again. There were clear expectations when I was his age. You see, I had an international career, and it was very clear in my case that I was going to travel abroad for a few days every month. That was clear when the children were born. So there was no way to do it differently. It wasn't possible. And then we had the family minister. Her name was Ursula von der Leyen, a family minister. And she made it possible for fathers to take parental leave so our press spokesman, he came to us, and he also said he would like to take two months off because he was now a father, parental leave. And I said, that's a good idea. Let's start with it that way. So I discussed this with our board, and the board said, well, what's that? Doesn't he want to work? Is he too lazy? Or why does he want two months off? So he was really uh, suspected of being just too lazy to go on working. But I think this has changed now. And I think now, even in the top management, um, in the higher levels of the hierarchy, it is normal for men to take 
more than two months off, maybe not seven months, but three or four months as parental leave, absence from work to take care of the child. That is also quite normal now in the higher management levels. So this has improved. The fathers also have the chance to spend time with the little child um, and to influence the little child and teach the little child that way. Well, I had a look at LinkedIn. And LinkedIn, um, there you can see some managers who even like to show this in public. They post a photo. There are managers that post photos of themselves with a baby on a mountaintop or taking care of the baby. Or the university professors who, are, uh, who have a profile on that website, again, they post photos of themselves with their son. Or they write something like, now I'm back from my parental leave. These seven months have been the most important seven months of my life. Yes, exactly. You should not underestimate the importance of that, because these people are role models, of course. And if they publicly talk about it that way, then we shouldn't underestimate the importance. You see, we, in our association, we also try to make sure that the public has more and more awareness of this. And there are many big companies um, that hire young recruits, you know, young managers or young scientists. And what the young recruits typically ask is not, will I get a company car, but do you have a kindergarten here at the company? Or is it possible for me to take a seven-month leave if we have a baby? So obviously, the wishes of the young recruits, of the young managers and scientists have really very much changed. And that is something very positive. And now that we've come to talk about it, there's one more thing I'd like to say about it. Um, it's a thought that, I, that came to me while I listened to the uh, presentation this afternoon, uh, Bjorn's pre uh, presentation this afternoon, um, you know, when you have a child, it's like a project. I mean, either it is just destiny, coincidental, accidental. But otherwise, you plan it. It's like a project. And you plan. You say, let's have one child. Let's have several children and raise them. And for such a project to be successful, you need a good partnership. This, this means it's not only you who has to be a good partner, but the woman, the, your partner, um, also has to be a good partner. So you both depend on each other. It's a game of give and take. And we raised three boys. And the only reason why that worked so well was because my wife, you see, we, we have now separated, but my wife was a fantastic partner for this project. So it was a super successful project that I'm really proud of. And. You know, you just described your uh, initialization, how the child was there, and all of a sudden you sorted out your lives. It was similar in my case, except that was way back in 1992 when our first son was born. I was there during the birth. He, he came eight weeks too early and um, had to stay at the hospital, and the only one who could really uh, visit him there was me during the time. And when I saw him lying there, the little boy lying there on his stomach at the hospital, I actually he was even an incubator and I saw him lying there on the stomach and there was kind of an explosion within me. I saw this boy lying there and I said, I want to be there for this little human being. I want to do anything for him. There are no limits to what I would be willing to do in order to help and support this child. And that's the strongest feeling that I've ever experienced in my whole life. It was even much, much more stronger than the first time I fell in love, for example. So this is really an extreme situation. Quite a lot happens, quite a lot changes about your conscience and the way you see the world. So on the one hand, you have the rational aspects. You say, what do I have to do? What do I have to organize? What, does my, what should my partner be look like? These are the things that you can plan inside your mind. But the things that go on here in your heart, they are the really important part, the things that happen in your heart. And they are so moving. They change the world so much that I think there is no other experience that can even compare to this. I would like to ask you a follow-up question. I've heard such stories from many fathers. Then I get home from my job and I forget all my stress. Once he smiled, I can. He looked like an alien when he came out of his mother's womb. So interesting. The first week or so, yes. Uh, it's uh, very stressful uh, and many things change. But uh, first, he was 
only thing. It was not such a rocking moment. My feeling was rather the more he becomes interactive, the more he can respond, the more he can smile towards me, then we will grow together. Well, I would never have left him on the street, <laughs> far from it. But you hear it quite often. It was mind-boggling. It was uh, a profound transformation. But I would suppose that there are so many fathers who cannot uh, make anything with uh, the kids. Uh, there are also many mothers who have a post -mo uh, postnatal depression. We have, uh, we, I do not, uh, I'm not a Rhinelander. We have a Rhinelander here. Every fool is different. I found it quite touching what you just told. I had uh, the same experience with my second daughter in the incubator. They wanted to put her into the incubator because she was 0.1 degree too cold. Who takes the decision? I asked. Well, it's up to you. Then I said, so give me a blanket. I think a blanket is better than an incubator. So I believe the hormone prolactin is something similar. Well, I have never felt so. How can I describe it? Mm, masculine, it would be a cliche. I have never felt so strong, so important, so decisive, and so crucial as in that moment. Well, I, I wanted to say, well, I, I, I'm getting lost. It's different. With some people, it's rather a process. Uh, I know your experience. Uh, it's so blue and with my first baby. I thought, why is it so blue? It was not the overwhelming moment. Now it is there, but that does not uh, play such a big role whether it happens instantaneously or through a longer process. What matters is that we take over this responsibility and enter into this relationship. So one discovers um, aspects. You become much more decisive and clear-cut. Somebody gives me, um, shakes me up while passing by. And if somebody tries to do the same thing with my son, I would, I would uh, defend him. And uh, can we also integrate you? You th detect uh, sides in your personality that you did not know. Definitely. Well, I felt uh, reminded of a um, of my first uh, daughter. It was a Caesar's birth, uh, and uh, then uh, she was resting, uh, sleeping on my breast. Uh, it's uh, it was like a paradise. Uh, these feelings were there from the beginning and continuous. Uh, well, they modified uh, slightly, but this is, uh, of course, uh, the case with any feelings. Everybody has uh, th his own uh, fatherhood. There is no instruction manual. Everybody is different. Uh, the individual fatherhood and also the individual relationship, how you can live parenthood together. It depends also on the child. For example, if a child uh, sleeps only two hours per night, I know also parents uh, that have utterly different ideas and thoughts and feelings. Last night, I reached that point. Uh, my girlfriend had too little sleep. Uh, once uh, the baby starts crying, it's so loud, much louder than in front of a box. Uh, my feeling was to throw her out of the window. <laughs> well, these were so gross and so awkward feelings. I have never felt anything like it. Or, or when, uh, when my girlfriend stays out overnight in a hotel because uh, elsewhere to, to take a time off. Well, I still love him, but uh, there are also very uh, so in this case, uh, masculinity is uh, needed. How often would uh, mothers or human beings exchange their feelings? Would they say, oh, I don't love my child anymore? What's that? If you detect such uh, strange feelings, um, mother, mothers do that. Uh, 
I wrote on a book title, a Mother's Exchange in uh, Café uh, down to the finest fabric of their motherhood. Uh, while fathers don't talk about this, they do it far too little. The present ones uh, are certainly an exception to this rule. Even those uh, negative feelings, talking about these negative feelings is also important. I think it uh, would be so utterly valuable to have a, a close male friend, a men's group, or a father probably even. Well, if uh, you are fortunate enough to have a father to who you can talk about this, to exchange views on this, well, I will have to leave you on time. Uh, my best friend, who is a young father, lives here in Berlin. Sorry. We are going to do just that, exchanging our ideas, because we started exchanging our views. Because as you put it, these are, well, falling in love. Uh, well, we know what it means, sadness of a lost lover. But that was a really stark in my, uh, my own life. Uh, but having these feelings, well, to have an exchange on this. I think uh, men uh, pay too little attention to this. Well, talking about negative feelings or unpleasant feelings, what I noticed, and I would l like to learn from you, all of a sudden I uh, to notice, I am the, a spitting image of my father, especially those sides uh, of my father that I loathed. I detect them also in myself. I. For example, I don't have the energy to pay attention to myself. Uh, I see Netflix or smartphone. These are wonderful gadgets to distract oneself from the needs of the relationship or of the son. So my father would have read the newspaper, would have insisted on reading his newspaper. Is this also a different reconciliation with your own fathers because you suddenly realize now I'm in the same trap. No, unfortunately not. Everybody is different. In my case, my father, born 1933, he was not present at birth uh, while his children were. He was always a self-employed man. Uh, practically, I had nothing of my father. I, he was simply not present. I was really annoyed also in retrospect. He still lives. I have uh, pardoned him. So I'm not uh, cross at him. He simply didn't know better, especially he had lost his father at the age of 11. So he didn't have a role model. He had to do without a father, which was certainly difficult enough. I wanted to do things differently. That was my firm purpose. I wanted to be a present father. In my job, this proved to be very difficult. Well, the solution I found, I mm, sacrificed something throughout um, the first 15 years of the children. I renounced the friendships I had uh, to live without uh, friendships. I had only during the weekdays, my profession, while the weekend was completely set aside for the children. And I stuck to this rule. But I also realized uh, quite vividly, vividly how much I had to postpone to a later point in time. I simply didn't have the time. And I used my time to do things with my children. We, I drove them uh, to athletics tournaments. Uh, we went sailing together. What an adventure some father can do with his children, which was a great thing to do. I enjoyed it greatly. But I also believe it would have been even better if I had succeeded or if the framework conditions were designed in such a way that uh, profession, family, and friendships uh, share an equal portion in your life. Uh, uh, this uh, happened later at age 45, 50. Um, our children were mature enough. They could go on their own. That was the time when I started taking care of myself. Sorry to interrupt you. I don't think that you should have balanced it, uh, even though I find it annoying. Well, this claim, we need to find the work-life balance. We need to be equally. No, we don't have to. You may wish it, but uh, 
you still kept this wish and you can uh, could realize it for um, uh, realize it later but you sacrifice something it's an illusion to believe that you can balance off everything you you have uh, the additional uh, owners of the children and you have to sacrifice. No, it's clear that you have to sacrifice in part also sexuality for a certain time, intensity or frequency of sex. Well, the question is rather to renounce consciously, not just oppress it. And then you start with mutual accusations, sexuality. Well, it's probably due to the fact that I look uh, so untidy or unkempt, well, we must take a clear decision or we must realize, well, this is probably uh, of secondary importance. Uh, I find it annoying when uh, people keep saying, we, you need to balance it off. Everything must be balanced off. This must end in utter failure. So you provide uh, consulting to many fathers, not only in separation context. Uh, do you think they b exercise a lot of pressure on themselves? Well, we ha there is a pressure. Well, the, the relationship has gone apart. Uh, and there is quite often the fear, can I meet my child regularly? Can we manage? Can I manage? So the situation is different from what we are seeing here, where you have a partnership parenthood. Here, in, in this case, the parenthood or the, the partnership has split apart and primordial fears come up because fathers want to stay with the children, but we've heard it. It's not so easy in Germany. I would wish uh, to, uh, at times, to live in Scandinavia. Uh, they have uh, also their problems, but not these ones. The emotional stress is high. And the children suffer from it because, of course, they sense these uncertainties and these feelings. So that's why we uh, ask the parents all the time, try to look at your children. What can you give to them as a gift? Not as a competitor to the mother in a separation. May at times even have an advantage. I can talk of myself. Uh, how can you live uh, your fatherhood? Uh, a role model. At the beginning, we lived together, of course. And uh, I was always in deep thoughts about my fatherhood. There were situations where we reached a point, oh, an, a moment of rest would be nice. But on the other hand, you said, what am I missing out on? I can f certainly catch up with my job later on, not uh, the childhood. Uh, for example, separation, things like household, doing the uh, everyday chores. I do that while my child is not with me. To focus on the child while uh, he or she is here, I will not go out to the disco, I will not go to the next conference, but I reserve time for my child. This can be a very enriching experience, as difficult as the separation might be. To live your fatherhood, it may imply advantages as long as both parents accept and respect the mutual responsibility. This is quite often a, t a topic where we try to support the fathers uh, because m m the mother uh, is uh, not so positive in her attitude for certain concerns or also because the laser claim to the child. Uh, per se, uh, there is no preference for the mother both parents have uh, the same claim. Be there for your children, even if you are separated. It has nothing to do with the partnership with the mother, but uh, you, with your responsibility for your child, which will last for a lifetime. Yes. So let's uh, follow up on this uh, argument or this topic. How many families are really affected? We have seen the number of uh, children who live um, with a, a single parent, 1.6 million. No, this is not a, the correct number. These are the so-called uh, lone uh, so parents who has a single mother or a lo uh, There is no father. Is that right? There is no father in those cases? No. Uh, this is just where the uh, where the home address of the child is registered. Please, there are low um, single mothers and fathers. For example, if 
Otherwise, uh, only statistically they do not appear. We have also separate uh, parents. I uh, explained this to a parliamentarian. What are you for your father? I'm father. And uh, the mother is a, a lone mother, a single mother. And what are you? Well, he did not know. Uh, 1.6 million children in the care of just one parent. There is only a small portion where you just have one parent. Otherwise, we have uh, separated parents, uh, all beat with different time shares per year. We have 200,000 children that are affected by separation and divorce, 130, 40,000. Then we have separations. So per year, it's a high number. I need to praise those parents that do not need a court procedure, but that uh, find a settlement out of court, where the parents, uh, how many, uh, what's the percentage? Uh, it's not known exactly, because they w will never appear. Well, well, we think 70 to 80% of all parents who less or more get by or manage it, have arranged, have found an arrangement, then yet another 20% where it becomes difficult where you need uh, consulting, where you need support, where there might even be a court case and a residual uh, value of 5% where it's uh, really difficult, uh, where there are many court cases where you have tried to go out of your way to stay a father and where even uh, throughout the years there is no agreement. So you take care of the really hard cases, parents, uh, are separated uh, and they do not want to communicate, to talk to each other, or probably even a court case. Uh, well, the fathers want uh, to stay in touch with the child, uh, but they are not allowed to. Uh, well, I lost. Uh, I, I got lost. How? What uh, is it really the case that the mothers are still uh, superior in terms of legal, in practical terms? Yes. Legally, no. Both parents have the same rights and uh, duties. Uh, there is no law determining that after the separation, the father sees the child once in a fortnight. But why is it that uh, uh, 80 or 90 percent uh, uh, end up with the mother? What does it mean, end up? We have in this room also so many cases uh, that have uh, the shared parenthood. Afterwards, uh, we we have a str very strong image of the mother and a very weak father's image. This is the aftermath. It has always been that way, and it is never questioned. Uh, but there are certain things that are moving. Reimer, please uh, no GDR 2.0 because in Eastern Germany, we have a much better understanding of joint parenthood, a better understanding. So something is moving forward, but fathers have to fight against the role concepts. A mother is per se good. A father needs to prove it, must be judged by yardsticks that are in the hands of the mother. The fa fathers are those. Uh, that leave, abandon their, you know, uh, I don't want this, uh, if you say, these are the ones who do not pay uh, money to their mothers. But that's the way fathers are. Uh, also accusations, allegations of uh, violence, uh, and also the general picture of the father. We have seen the Edeka advertisement, and, uh, where can fathers nurture their children uh, in, um, uh, over summer? There is a general mistrust uh, towards fathers, almost a critical sense. What does the father do? It is there. Yesterday afternoon, I switched through the two fathers, uh, lone fathers at home, and there were various mothers who judged the fathers. That was a high court. It, it was a summary court. Court, I thought, hey, how queer is a uh, show? For example, pulling uh, the, uh, your children by the legs and the mothers almost get a heart attack. The father must not do this. The society does not accept it. 
the yardstick is so high, after uh, the separation, you are measured by this, not only by female judges and female assistants in the youth authorities. They always cast a critical look at uh, the fathers. Uh, they carry these pictures. Well, you see, um, today I happened to sit at a table with one of the fathers who eventually got in contact with you. And this man told me, the judge said, you're allowed to see the boy, you're allowed to take the boy to school that day. But what happened was when he tried to do that, when he wanted to take the boy to school that day, the mother came there as well. The mother went there uh, with, uh, with police officers and said, no, now I take charge of the boy. Well, that's interesting. This may happen in some individual cases. Normally, the police try to keep their fingers out of these things, but it may happen. Yes, but what do you do with your emotions then? You have a right to take the boy to school and uh, then all of a sudden the mother arrives with a police officer and claims that you have no right to take the child. You feel frustrated, you feel angry, you feel powerless. What do you do with your emotions in that moment? You have to talk with these people somehow. Well, you should show your emotions, maybe not in that very moment, but, um, well, either when you're back in the car, you can shout or you sit down together with a friend and complain. Don't always swallow your emotions up. I mean, you have to in that situation because the child is there. In the presence of your child, you shouldn't start shouting, of course. It's a question of being a responsible father. But still, it's a challenge to deal with the situation because they, you see, <laughs> they keep causing you prob uh, trouble, you know. They keep doing that. We once worked with a father who um, was um, a victim of violence, and he called the police. And what happened? He was... Um, kind of expelled from his flat. He was no longer lo allowed to stay at his flat. And he said, well, I found the police. I um, have these wounds. Have a look here. And the police officers, they said, well, but you're the father, so you have to leave the flat. They didn't even think about that, you know. Of course, it was wrong, but it was their routine to say, if there's violence at home, then the father has to leave the flat. I mean, you're laughing about that, but it is totally unfair when you think about it. We're talking about children here. We're talking about the role of parents and also the abuse of abuse. So it's not always the men who are the perpetrators, who are the offenders. They can also be the victims. And we're talking about a situation that even involves children here, so we have to be very careful. And I think with that respect, a lot more has to happen. In Germany, in the mountain, we still have to overcome there is at least the Mount Everest. Do I take it, if you're a man, you want to take care of the child, but the mother doesn't show good will, then you'll have trouble. Um, does that mean that some men just give up and say, okay, in that case, I just don't try anymore because I don't want to expose my child to the stress um, with the police and going to court and everything. So which of the two options is better for the child, a father who fights or a father who says, okay, I give up? Well, I think the father who fights is better for the child. Of course, it has to be um, appropriate, but if the child grows up without the father, will have consequences for the rest of their lives. And you can't compensate for that anymore later on. There are certain things that you can catch up, that you can make up for. But at the time that you've lost with your father, that's something you can never catch up again later on. The child will ask the father, why were you not there? So do fight. Try to fight. Try to be there for your children, as hard as that may be. And there are situations when, there's, when somebody treats you unfairly in an unjust way, you have to swallow your emotions in that moment because you tell yourself, I do this for my child now. I swallow my emotions for my child. Of course, sooner, sooner or later you make it to a point where you say, I can't take it anymore, or now I can't go on fighting because this would kill my child. I hope you will never have to make that decision one day because that is not humane, but um, it may happen that you have to make this decision one day. It can be possible. So there's no one-size-fits-all solution to this problem. Try to keep an eye on your kids try to have an eye on them, try to be there for them for as long as possible, and try to keep them out of all the fights and quarrels related to a separation, at least as much as possible, of course. Children remark a lot, they hear a lot, they see a lot, and it's also okay to contact us or psychologists, psychologists for advice to get support. You don't have to be ashamed of doing that. Um, I think the men here, um, the men who are present here, they don't have any problem with that. But I think there are lots of men who believe they are never allowed to be weak or to cry. But of course, it is allowed. It's also allowed to show our children our feelings, for example, when we are sad. And um, I think 
Yes, here I'm preaching to the converted, obviously, but we have to bring home the message to the wider public because for two days we're now discussing here in a bubble that is not the same as the world out there. The world out there is tougher, colder, and it accepts um, us as fathers who want to be committed, not as much as we would want public to accept us. So I can only say you're on a mission now. You are men on a mission. Spread the message. Okay, thank you very much. Now here we talked about emotions, about crying, about showing or letting the child know that you are sad. I think you also mentioned that in our preparatory talks for this session. I think in your family farm project, you were the one who added the emotional aspects. Yes, um, I thought it was very important because this does not only apply to situations where you have a big crisis. You should always try to get help when you need help, quite generally speaking. And even in your normal family life, as a man, as a father, you are not necessarily the one who takes the children to the scouts or who is an, an adventurer and who does all the, these crazy things with both the son and the daughter. No, it is also important for the father to have a soft side and to be allowed to show that side, that soft, soft part of the character now and then, and also to talk about, well, his feelings, the state that he's in. And that's something that we all find a bit difficult. When my boys became teenagers, when they, uh, when their adolescence started, they became more and more introverted, which is a totally normal thing to happen during adolescence. But it con continued and persisted. And I said, it's weird. They don't ever talk about themselves. And then one day, I looked at me in the mirror and I said, well, it's no wonder they don't talk about themselves. I don't talk about myself either. So I said, I have to take the first step. I have to make a change. And I um, yeah, I made an effort and really communicated my internal conflicts to my children. I discussed that with them. And in the beginning, I was a bit afraid of this conversation of talking about my inner feelings and showing myself in such a vulnerable condition, in such a vulnerable state. But surprise, surprise, the boys loved it. They found it totally cool to see how I really exposed myself. And the next step was they also opened up and they also shared their most inner thoughts and worries and problems with me. So today, I'm really grateful um, because in the beginning, I had in the beginning I had made this mistake. I didn't really share a lot of my inner life with my uh, children, but I learned from that and I changed that. And that leads to a situation where my two boys, who are now 21 and 27 years old. We are still in contact. We have a good contact. We can talk about intimate things as well. And I'm mega proud of that one. Talking about intimate topics, well, um, Normally, you can't choose or pick your children. They are born into this world, and maybe they are totally different people than you are. You have actually three sons, so I'd like to know a bit more about that. Do you have this feeling, I mean, of course, you try to be there equally for each of them, but do you have this feeling that you feel a bit closer to one of them on a human level because that son is most similar to you? And there's another son who seems to be a bit strange because he's so different from you. And if that was the case, then how did you handle that? Well, I think that is natural. I mean, it's not just a question of, it's not just myself, it's also the mother who threw her genes into the pool. So um, all three sons we have are totally different from each other. They're not one like the other, but totally different from each other, not just the way they look, but also their character is very different. Their nature, their character differs. So. Um, of course, the oldest son, the um, firstborn son, of course, this was a premiere. You know, the birth was something extremely special because it was the first child. Of course, the other two sons, when they were born, this was also a special experience. But the first son was really like an icebreaker. It was extremely special when he was born. Um, so in a way, he has a very special um, status, even though I wouldn't really say that I love him more than my other two sons. I would never say that. But of course, when they grow older, during their lives, you discover certain 
characteristics, certain features of character. And here I have to say that I feel very close to my middle son currently because we both have one characteristic, one quality that uh, makes us very similar. And we can talk about that quite a lot. I mean, I talk with all three sons, but in particular with the middle son. Do you ever have this feeling that is maybe also quite good if the son has a different role model than you? For example, my son, he's only one year old, and we'll see how he will develop. But my impression is that he is much more robust than I am. He has definitely got more energy, and he will probably start his life totally differently than I did. I'm, well, I like to take it slow, to take a break now and then. But my son has a lot of power, so I think it's a good idea for him to spend a lot of time with my father, with his grandfather, because my, uh, his grandfather is also a powerhouse, full of energy. Or would you say that as a father, you have to be the role model, even if the son is totally different, um, has a totally different character and potential? Well, um, you see, I'm not a diehard. I'm not a, an adventurer. And in a way, I'm almost a feminine type. And my middle son said a few years ago that when I was a kid, I always thought you were all <laughs> you, our mom. And I thought, oh, that, that, that's cool. Thank you very much for the compliment. And then um, when my sons left our household, it was quite OK for me because there were some friends of mine, also some cousins who were real men, you know, real guys. They were totally cool. So I sent my sons to the forest, to the woods, together with these cousins and friends of mine who were so masculine. Um, so I think it's great to give your kid the chance to collect, ex to gain experiences and well, to experience things with other adults as well, because I'm only one adult. I'm just one type of character. So what would be better than, well, showing all different kinds of people to your children? I think that's a positive thing. And when I say all different kinds of people, I'm not only referring to teachers at school, but also teachers in life that they might want to find. Well, uh, up to now, there has not been a single controversy. We are rather united, uh, which is uh, quite, well, probably we are not bold enough. But uh, probably it's a good moment uh, to involve the audience. Do you have any questions uh, that you want to get off your chest? And do you, yeah, I, uh, I, I have a question. In this moment, when I was uh, becoming a father, I looked back at my own father topic. Uh, I had this in my mind. When I was uh, in a father in the making, in a few months, I could ch carefully checked my behavior and uh, tried to judge uh, how would my father react to such a situation. It was interesting. It's still um, the, the case today. Hopla. Look at this. I'm, uh, I react uh, like my father when I fight with, or with, when I have a conflict with my partner, with Uli. Well, then my father did the same thing. I um, am not yet there to say some years ago my aunt uh, came forward and said, look at this. Uh, photograph of your father, you look very much the same. And that was a very sad experience for me. And I then thought, well, I have adopted certain traits of my father's, while others uh, do not belong to me. So I could uh, create a greater proximity. I just wanted to, this, to say this, to drop this in. Well, uh, this has brought me back very much to the father topic. Uh, OK, here is the first question. The microphone, please. I wanted to say I found it very touching what you shared with us about this feminine aspect of masculinity. I would shy away from calling this feminine, because I, I think we uh, men can also be very sensitive. And, uh, I work with boys. I'm also an educator. I work a lot with female primary school teachers who have lots of problems with boys in class. We know this. 
shame is worse than uh, fault. Before I get uh, laughed at, I rather beat them up. Uh, quite often the female teachers react with uh, a lack of understanding towards uh, the young boy because they go cannot see behind the curtains. Winnie Brown, you know him, her probably. She did research into shame and resilience to shame. One mechanism to deal with uh, shame or uh, is to be able to cope with vulnerability. Why don't you allow boys to feel ashamed or to feel embarrassed? Where will they learn it? Uh, to feel uh, of, uh, offended, uh, so well, I would say it's a plea, a spontaneous reaction. Did you wave your hand? No, you just wanted to pass on the microphone. Really, uh, a plea for m more vulnerability. I saw your hand first. Uh, then I will leave it to you. You may mm, figure out uh, the order. Hello, Ludwig. Well, I, I need uh, to praise you. It's one of the most uh, cred uh, believable and also mindful analysis that I could ever witness. Thank you very much. Well, in November, I'm going to be a father. As a matter of fact, I'm in training as a teacher, school teacher. I uh, am close to 100% employment, and I have probably only 50% of the output that I'm going to um, perform in the future. Once my kid is born, I will have uh, to state it openly. I need to go down 50% if I want to build up this full potential. Now, my concern is, being right now in the full swing of this training, and if I have to put in 200%, I will be so stressed that I cannot fulfill my father's role as much as I want to. So right now it looks as if I'm going to take one month of parental leave, and the mother will take the remaining 13 months. Uh, and I'm deeply concerned that I will uh, for the rest of my life, uh, feel repentance uh, about what I uh, did. How can how can I get out of this conundrum or of this dilemma? Who wants to respond to this? May I say? Because I'm closest uh, to where you are, I can tell you. Well, you talk about 100 percent. You you uh, I assume it's about uh, 40 hours per week, 50 hours per week. Okay. I have uh, I uh, take a rather pragmatic view. Fifty hours per week, you are elsewhere, where you have to look after your job or whatever. But the remaining time, you are at home. That's my thing. I believe uh, it is still much more than my father was present. And B, it's uh, great. It's so much time. My feeling was. My feeling is not that I'm missing out so much. The, the problem is really, are you at home physically? That's, oh, I will switch on Netflix, or I will just uh, look at my cell phone. I'm at home. I'm available, physically there. That's, I take a pragmatic view. If it's your situation, so be it. It does not mean that you are not going to have uh, a second child. It's your situation. You may turn it upside down. It's a commitment. So I perform my job, and I try to make sure that I'm fully present at home. Uh, probably you can confirm this, or the others here. It's great. It feels great. It feels so, so great. May I take off some steam? The first months, yes, they are great. But if after six or nine months you can take time, it's still valuable. We are not always living in the ideal world. We cannot uh, shape the world according to our wishes. So uh, you should not put yourself under too much pressure. 
You can also put aside certain other duties, but not during your childhood, but be as present, as much present as you can, as uh, the conditions uh, allow. But try to plan ahead. What about the, um, the time in, in six months, in 12 months? What time can you use to shape your fatherhood? You are a very advanced in a very luxurious position. I have questioned many fathers. What about becoming a father, most of them, the first two years? Well, there's not much to, to tell about the first two years. Only afterwards will the uh, children become uh, interesting. Great. Be physical present. So great. So you take out seven months of parental leave uh, with the second child. Thank you very much. Uh, so our microphones are passed around, have you? Let's take uh, this one, uh, the man in the blue T-shirt. Probably there is also time. You passed by, OK. Ludka, you as a father and also as a young uh, grand Father, how did your self-image change having become a grandfather? Have you become a different father being now a grandfather? Has your position in life changed once again? Because your genes have multiplied once again. Well, uh, I haven't even put this question to me. The birth of my granddaughter two years ago was a sensation, an outstanding event. It was great becoming a grandfather, but it's different. You uh, Basically, you're not involved. Others uh, took care of that, looked after it. Others uh, have uh, their responsibility, my son and his wife. The great thing about grandparents is you have the joy, but you, you don't have responsibility and no work. It's totally different from becoming a father. Therefore, I would say no. My father's role towards the other boys has not changed. Uh, uh, my general feeling in life is different. Although I became a grandfather at an early age, at the age 56, uh, you get the feeling, well, probably I have carried out my duties because I have uh, coped with all the tasks on my way. I could uh, die the next day. Well, you have no responsibility. I would contradict uh, this uh, because you have a re responsibility as a grandfather. You have to pass on your experience from generation to generation. It somehow gets lost as we are localized in so many places. Uh, Therefore, the questions that might uh, pop up in the sons that are becoming uh, fathers themselves, I think it's still an important task uh, uh, that rests on the shoulders of uh, grandfathers and grandmothers. Uh, quite a valuable point here. I share this with you. The fact that I became a grandfather at such an early age uh, when uh, the young girl turns uh, 13, 14, 15, I can take her to mountains or uh, the, uh, to the very end, back of the hall, there is one to the left. Well, my exciting question to all the panelists, Lutka, I think uh, mentioned this. We are living in a bubble here for two days. How can we reach uh, the men and women outside of our bubble with our purpose to create? It was not Ludger, but it was rather Marcus. Or Björn. But the question goes to all panelists. Well, I feel really qualified to give an answer to this. That's exactly what I'm trying to do. because. I started writing books about this topic because I was no longer satisfied with one-to-one uh, -one communication or in the case of men's groups. I want to reach more addressees um, in two ways. Education, yes. We need to do much more further training for judges, prosecutors, and the police. Uh, 
but I also accept all the reading events because I'm keen on talking to people. I also give interviews to Bild der Frau, this uh, rather down-to-earth uh, women's magazine, because even women should start uh, dealing with this topic. And the old, uh, the private is political, that's an old adage. I think we should also pass it on in our personal environment. For example, if you go through such a discriminatory experience, or in the sense that if you go out with uh, two friends who are parents themselves, uh, you chat about this and that, then it's about, uh, about how to dress uh, the children, and both fathers are not even looked at. Martina, you could also ask me. But, well, I dressed the kid too. My wife would say, she would say, she would say, I should not act so much uh, or try to teach uh, our uh, friends and family. I, the la uh, so, uh, so please cut out the last phrase. Uh, now, you have already signed your uh, consent uh, to the. We need positive role models. Uh, we saw this uh, both in business, uh, in politics. I think uh, parenthood uh, was uh, uh, the biggest failure was uh, Jutta Schwesig. She turned it upside down. Wouldn't it be good? Uh, the, uh, wouldn't it be good to have the ministry under the leadership of uh, both a man and uh, a woman for uh, role model, uh, living the parenthood? Um, I have become a father to communicate it openly. I stand up to this. Whenever such a positive or negative discrimination happens, to you should say, no, that's not OK. Why don't you stand up like a man? It would be easy. The mother does it. No, I do it myself. I try to get through with it, Posi live positive examples. Ask also, for example, well, I took so much free time, two months of parental leave. Don't say super, but why only two months? So bring this to the forefront. Uh, question the normal attitudes. I'm uh, separate. I see my children only every week, and we have so many images. Raising a child alone or with separated parents, uh, we must replace uh, role models. That must not uh, need not be necessarily absolute. And if I may add, uh, also standing up uh, when a discrimination is uh, directed against women. It's almost the, uh, yes, uh, the, the day before yesterday I was asked about the family. A woman asked me, women are as uh, unreflective. What about your women? Will your wife also win some extra income? She does not win an extra income. She has an income. Full stop. The cliche is clear. I don't have to explain it to you, but I had to explain it to the to earn an extra income. And we as fathers, we need to ha give extra help. I am not helping my wife. I do it. I do the household chores. The three of us, we are all self-employed. I think it's a luxury that you have much more decisional uh, space. Uh, when we say 50 percent, when as an employee, 50 percent is rather 70 or 80 percent. So men or managers, do they really have a chance? Uh, I will reduce my working time. Um, or would they have the problem that they still work the same low workload as before, but earn only half the money? Well, you cannot give a generalized answer. We have uh, so-called expert careers. These are academics that work in companies where they can divide uh, their workload in two. You can take a pioneering role, and you can stay home for a longer time or work only half time or introduce leadership in part time. But look at the other 
end of the pyramid and at the very top uh, CEO in part time. Well, that's difficult to imagine. Well, there are some few models where even women are sitting on the board of companies and uh, they do not work uh, part time 50, 50. They would probably work 80% of these scheduled working hours. That's a step in the right direction. They have delegated this part of their workload, uh, and it will come increasingly. But for example, uh, the head of the company fire brigade in BISF, you need to be abreast of ev everything that happens 24 hours a day. You cannot share this responsibility. This is an, uh, a job that cannot be split up and nothing will change. But the bulk of it uh, will be open to such novelties. And the digitization will make uh, working more independent of uh, physical places. Probably will will make it uh, uh, in less than 500 years. Last but do you know the most embarrassing award of this year? It's uh, the father of the year. Why? The, the father or the husband of the astronaut, of the female astronaut that is going to go to the ISS and will take care of the baby. We would all shake our heads. It's something normal. In this bubble, yes, but outside there, we need such role models to make it visible. For us, it's utterly normal. So. We need to look beyond our horizon. We need to pick up the people where they are. This father does something which is not considered to be normal. He takes care of the infant of the small, of the very young child. So don't think about what is normal to us, but what is uh, normal or still novel. It would have been cool if he had uh, declined this award. Yes, OK. Looking at the clock, we have exceeded our allotted time by five minutes. So you, you have an, a, a date with your friend. So I would say let's call it a day. Thank you very much. Uh, the father's round that gave us uh, very vivid insight into the life of five fathers. Thank you, guys.